All righty, friends, here we go. If you're just jumping in, if you're on Zoom or on the phone, you can go to the chat. In the chat, there are links to my calendar to book a free consultation. There's links to my homepage, adamstevenscoaching.com. You can go there and learn all about me. I'm a life and wellness coach. Also, there's another link called wellbeingbootcamp.com. That is a link to learn about my in-person workshop series. The next one will be on August 21st here in St. Louis, Missouri in Chesterfield. And uh, then there's my email address. If any of you want copies of the PowerPoint slides, you can just hit me up in the chat, say hello, or email me at adam at adamstevenscoaching.com and I will get you the slides. So we're gonna see here if we can do a screen share and get this webinar going. Here we go. All right, we are rocking and rolling. So the title of this webinar is Obesity Transformation. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you're here to check it out. I, this is a part of my journey. I uh, was formerly morbidly obese and this is something I'm super passionate about. Uh, telling my story, talking about my journey and really just preaching the message that we can get well, that um, we don't have to be slaves to food addictions, alcoholism, smoking, all these terrible habits I had. I was in horrific health and really struggling and I really just became a comeback kid and turn things around probably around 10 years ago started and it's just been a journey ever since so obesity transformation everything you need to know about physical health and uh this will probably take me 25 30 minutes and i'll stick around for a q a but anyway i hope you're doing well and here we go so first slide my name is adam stevens like i said i'm a life and wellness coach i'm from st louis missouri i'm a father a husband a coach friend foodie big time cook runner, spiritual seeker, I'm a, a spiritual dude. Faith is a big part of my life. I'm married to my wife, Katie. We've been together almost 20 years. I've got two kids, Hannah and Ben, eight and four. And like I said in the intro here, I was formerly uh, over 300 pounds, quit, you know, heavy drinker, heavy smoker, um, sleep apnea, a lot of problems, depression, and uh, really started to take my journey a lot more seriously in probably 2009 or so and started to really work on my health. And I've learned a lot of the process and I've kind of really dedicated my coaching business, my coaching practice. A lot of what I do as a wellness and as a life coach to helping people get beyond this stuff. You know, I am a healthcare practitioner by background. I've worked in the ER and the ICU sleep center outpatient currently doing pediatrics work. So I, I'm a respiratory therapist. So lungs and heart cardiopulmonary system are totally my jam. And uh, I work, work with a lot of different patient populations to help them breathe better. And, uh, you know, breathing is good. It's a big part of health. So anyway, that's my background. That's who I am. Um, so next slide, my disclosures, right? So these are my opinions. I'm not paid by anyone. I don't offer products. I don't sell potions or uh, protein shakes or anything or any kind of plans. Uh, this is all stuff that I believe in, stuff that I've done myself. I worked with counselors, medical professionals, at a chiropractor, trainers. Uh, I, ter I currently attend recovery meetings, so I have kind of a recovery focus. I, I, I see some of these wellness issues as addiction issues, codependency issues, and I just do it one day at a time. So I'm, I'm not a guru myself. I'm not perfect. I don't believe in gurus. I don't believe in enlightenment. I just think we jump in there and do the best we can one day at a time. So anyway, um, what is health? Let's start there. Well, here's the Webster version, the dictionary a person's mental or physical condition, or the state of being free from illness or injury. And here, so there's, here's all the body systems. So when I went to Allied Health School and learned, uh, they, they sort of start you out in what's called AMP, anatomy and physiology. Anatomy is the structures of the body, and physiology is how those structures work, what they do, how they're supposed to function. And pathology or pathophysiology is what happens when the body structures or the body systems aren't um, doing well and functioning properly, and that is um, pathologies or disease processes. So they kind of teach you those things in those three different buckets. And I just put this slide here because the body systems are really important, and what you do to one area affects another. You know, if you smoke, for instance, you uh, reduce your oxygen consumption, you can blow out your lung tissue, and that puts an additional stress on your heart. Uh, if you have stress on your heart, you might have additional problems with your blood pressure. Uh, as well as electrolyte balances, kidney function, urinating, um, you know, your all, all kinds of stuff. So everything kind of is interwoven and interconnected. Everything from, you know, your pancreas, all your endocrine organs, your liver, your belly, your gut, your microbiome, everything is integrated. 
we are marvelous creatures. And um, so really you want to think systematically when you're thinking about health. We're not just talking about crazy fad diets or putting butter in your coffee or any of this foolishness. We're talking about you are a living, breathing thing and um, you're a very complex organism. And we have to approach it that way when we're going to talk about health because as, as I'll teach you more, morbid obesity is a hormonal issue. It's a big deal and um, it's a medical issue and we have to really approach it from the whole concept. So like I always say, I coach the health, the mindset and the soul. So I coach the physical being, I coach the mindset or the emotional, the intellectual being, and I coach the soul, really help people tap into that spirit and find out what they're really built for in life and what they'd like to accomplish. So got to take the systematic approach. Next slide, food first. So I always say start with your food, right? So there's food, there's fitness, there's meditation, there's health, there's all this stuff. Look, start with food, right? There's that really famous quote, I think it's Hippocrates, of let the food be the medicine, right? So Eating well reduces our risk of health issues. It helps with our moods. It's going to reduce the risk of disease like diabetes, heart disease, all this stuff that is widely preventable. A lot of what we treat in medicine are preventable illnesses that are related to your lifestyle, right? So food affects your mood, your sleep patterns, your energy level, and your general health, right? So this, uh, this image here on the right side of the screen is uh, the MyPlate um, I love my plate. I think it's great. It replaced the food pyramid, but my plate, as you can see, you've got fruits, vegetables, grains, proteins in your dairy. Um, you can add other starches to grains, such as potatoes, right? So corn is technically grain, but you can add potatoes. I say beans and legumes are kind of uh, hybrids, right? So they have protein and amino acids, but they also have starchy carbs and the fiber. So beans kind of fly up there, maybe as a grain or in that starch area with the amino acids and the proteins and the dairy almond milk, soy milk, anything that like a lot of these milks are fortified and they've got some of the additional um, stuff that you would see um, that you would get from the cow's milk, right? Food conspiracy theory. So when we talk about like the real bulk of what we hear about food, here's just a few. And I put these in here just for humor, but big food is conspired with big pharma to keep us sick and make money. Animal products are poison and the USDA has been bought off by meat and dairy lobbyists. Sugar industry produced the low-fat scare to sell more sugar. Kellogg's and create, created the, the breakfast is the most important meal slogan. Carbohydrates are unnecessary. We shouldn't eat them. They're bad. You don't eat carbs. You can, you know, your brain works better on gluconeogenesis and ketones anyway. You know, all this stuff, all this stuff, it's, it's BS and it's bad for you. So you got to have this overall approach. We know we have a lot of good science. And uh, in the ADA and the AHA and the food and the food.gov, you know, they're really going to back up. They're going to get they're going to lead with what really accepted science is. Right. And we all have biological diversity and we have different different ways that we um, that we need to feed ourselves based on disease processes, genetics, whatever. But for the most part, the jury's pretty well in on most of this stuff. And we do know foundationally, nutritionally uh, what is good for us. So the diet or. Right. The top slide, these are the hippies and the bottom slide is the cavemen. So I um, I'm going to tell you about my favorite dietary strategy or really lifestyle strategy, food strategy. But uh, on opposite sides of the spectrum are going to be the hippies. And you've guessed that those are the plant based vegan types. And on the other side will be your paleo people, your primals, your carnivores and your keto people. Those are going to be your meat people. Right. And uh, both are wrong. Both are not super sustainable. Both have their place. And I guess uh, if you followed them under the guidance so, and you were real careful and you made sure you were balanced, you could probably do all right on both. Although I'm still going to make the claim that you could do a lot better slightly towards the middle of the spectrum. And when we get to my favorite diet, I'm going to tell you what comes right down the middle and is easy to adapt and should work for almost all, all people. So plant-based or low carb, right? Hippies versus uh, hippies versus the cavemen, right? The hippies, John McDougall, Start Solution, Joel Furman, a uh, eat to live, big nutritarian guy. T. Colin Campbell is a PhD biochemist that uh, did China studies, st st stuff like that. He's real big on uh, vegan, plant-based. Esselstein is uh, from the Cleveland Clinic. He's a cardiologist who used the China study protocols to uh, in a, in a um, basically a high carbohydrate, low fat diet to begin to reduce um, heart disease. And he actually, in his model, the, uh, the vegan diet beat out angioplasty and, um, and um, some of these people actually cured their heart disease. They did quite well. The cavemen are Stephen Feeney. This is a guy, very low carb advocate, you know, who, who 
famously, you know, had, um, who spent seven years in ketosis, right? No carbohydrates. Dr. Uh, Fung, who wrote the obesity code, he's very much a keto advocate, but also um, is much more into fasting now. I think everybody's kind of jumping on this fasting camp. We're going to talk about fasting in a minute. Eric Berg is a chiropractor who's done a lot of uh, really kind of a YouTube celebrity about keto or the low carb diets. Mark Sisson uh, wrote Primal Blueprint. Out of everybody, I do like Mark. I think most of his stuff is good. I think he's an opportunist and I think he has cashed in and I, and I don't totally get some of the company he hangs out with, but I do think a primal sort of moderate paleo approach does work for me at least and uh, might not work for everybody, but it is, is it a good approach. And Robert Wolf's just another paleo guy. He's another guy that writes. He's a CrossFitter. A lot of the people in that more functional fitness camp, high conditioning camp, like real athletic type people are going to be more on the on the side of a lot more protein, a lot more animal proteins, um, vegetation, and hardcore workouts. They're going to be much more uh, focused on those um, those amino acids, fatty acids, and different types of fat. And um, but both sides, both both sides of this argument um, have flaws in 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 their in their theory and in the practice of these diets. So I'm just just making that case right now. So uh, next slide. Uh, so I say meet me in the middle, right? So a focus on vegetation and whole foods is really crucial. You have to have a focus on vegetables, whole foods. Um, there are challenges to both approach, approaches, as I just said. There's a lot of overlap, though. Dr. Hyman, who, you know, a lot of people think he's a quack. I do think in some regards he's a quack. But he did, he did make one little quote. He said, we should all be pegans. Vegans was his his little um, gaff about uh, paleos and vegans, right? And so if you think about it, you're going to see fruits, vegetables, uh, complex starches like squash, uh, sweet potatoes, nuts, seeds, stuff like quinoa. You're going to see a big focus on whole foods, whether you go to the vegan camp or to the paleo camp. So really, we should be focusing on that fruits, vegetables, complex starches, nuts and seeds, um, and then, you know, you probably, you know, good, good quality whole grains for whole grains for most people. That's going to be the bulk of your diet. And I think just about everybody would agree with that. Um, we should all incorporate nuts and seeds and fiber is a really big deal. I'll talk more about that, but fiber is a big deal. Uh, here's a plant cell. This image, the reason I'm using this image is because, as you see, if you remember from bio, biology, probably sixth, seventh grade, there was the plant cell and the animal cell and the cytoplasm and the endoplasm and reticulum and the nuclei and the nucleolus. The reason I'm showing you this slide is because it's got this thick green cell wall, and that thick cell wall in plants is what fiber is, right? You got soluble, you got unsoluble fiber, but that is actually indigestible by the human gut, so the gut has to work on it a long time. So it slows down absorption, it slows down digestion, and it buffers um, glucose. It buffers your blood sugar, so right? So if we have plenty of these plants, and we combine those with good amino acids and proteins, what we're going to do is we're going to give our body a ton of great nutrition. The plants have the phytochemicals, all the good vitamins and stuff, um, and, elect and all kinds of minerals, and we're going to give it some good amino acids and plenty of those plants in the vegetation and that fiber. That's going to give us a good bolus of nutrition, but it's going to burn out real slowly, and we're not going to get these huge sugar spikes that you're going to find in, in, in the real refined grains and sugars and some really just some of the crap that we're eating in our culture and it's readily available to us. So we're all different. So some people do better on that higher protein, low glycemic fruits, less grain. I'm one of those people. Um, I can tolerate some grains, but for the most part, I tend to uh, have them booking them on the end of my night. I do a lot better on protein, low glycemic fruits, nuts, seeds, good stuff during the day, just really lowish carbs. I'm, I'm not a keto person, but just lower, uh, not a whole big bolus of potatoes, beans, uh, rice, or anything like that until later in the evening. And the purpose for that is it's a lot easier for me to control my appetite when I stick to the proteins, fruit. I eat a huge salad every day. My mantra is same salad every day. It's something I do. It's a food prep thing. I'm going to talk about that more in a couple slides. Some people do really amazing on legumes, fruits, and grains. So legumes are going to be your beans, your peanuts, your peas, anything that grows in a pod. Some people do really great on grains. You know, I have family members, excuse me. I have family members who do great on grains, right? So it's, it's to each his own and you need to be honest with yourself and see where you're at and your body and uh, your struggles will probably tell you what you need to do if you're honest with yourself. 
Uh, you need to consider your health issues and your age, right? Um, gender specific issues. So things are different based on men have much more muscle mass, they have much more testosterone. Women have more estrogen. Also, women go through menopause. So there's different things that you need to be uh, thinking about fitness and activity level. You know, I mean, a lot of what we see in the fitness world and in some of the nutrition world, it's really based off athletes. So the people who go and do the research, they study bodybuilders and athletes because those are the people who will show up and eat that way. They're looking to do anything they do they can do to get an edge, right? So those people will, um, they'll participate in the research. They'll take steroids. They'll do whatever. So most of the um, the good, like, so the stuff in the previous slides, right? Esselstein, T. Colin Campbell, a lot of these people who've done this research they're doing this research on the basics of human and medical health, whereas a lot of what comes out of the fitness world and, and somewhat into the nutrition world is based on all this research that's really, um, you know, like your basic thing, like you got your fitness model, you got your basically ripped dude or your ripped chick, and there's protein shakes and tons of chicken breast and broccoli and, uh, and your athletic greens, your greens and all, and your hydration and all. And so there's just this real big emphasis on I don't really think that really a lot of people are being represented in a way. I don't think that really a lot of people are being taught just the basics for what you need for metabolism, for good bone density, for good vital signs, for your blood, blood pressure, for your heart. Um, I don't think people are really focusing on that. I think people are have a different objective. Sometimes the objective in our culture is how we want to look versus what our body needs to function well and feel well. So how you look your BMI or your body fat percentage, that's only one part of the equation. You should always be focusing on how you feel and what your overall health is, you know? So also, you know, preferences with and disordered eating history. If you have a history of compulsively dieting, if you were overweight as a child, all of this goes in and we have to look at these factors. We have to look at social factors, anything that's going to affect long-term adherence. So that's the last thing on this, the last bullet point on this slide is long-term adherence, right? So no matter what you do, you need to be able to um, consistently replicate it. You need to be able to wake up every day and eat these foods and, uh, and nourish yourself in a way that makes sense. It's easy and that you can adhere to. Otherwise, you're just going to be kind of running around back and forth and really struggling, right? So make it easy on yourself. Otherwise, we've also got this next slide. This is metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a group of different conditions. It really is all this stuff that affects our heart, our brain, you know, diabetes, strokes, and it really has a lot to do with the efficiency of how we metabolize um, carbohydrates and our overall health, right? What you're going to see in metabolism, you're going to see belly fat, you're going to see high blood sugars, you're going to see low levels of the good cholesterol, that's high density lipo lipoprotein or HDL, uh, high levels of triglycerides, which are your blood fats, and you're going to see that larger waist circumference, You'll often see higher levels of LDL, which is your low density lipoprotein, sometimes called your bad cholesterol. So you're just in this situation where the body's not efficient and the body's really, it's like reversed, right? You've got, um, you're storing fat versus burning fat. You really get in a situation, and a lot of people have this, to be quite honest. If you work a desk job and you're overweight or you're obese, um, high likelihood you're heading in this direction, right? Sometimes they'll call it pre-diabetes, that there's a high likelihood you're heading in this direction. Whatever you're experiencing now, add five, 10 years of that, and you're going to be coming up uh, against really aggressive health challenges. And if this stuff is setting in with you already, no matter how old you are, if you're 30, 40, 50, 60s, you need to be on top of it. So always, um, always be thinking about this stuff and go out and Google, Google metabolic syndrome. Watch some YouTube videos on metabolic syndrome. It's really fascinating stuff. So what's the deal with saturated fat? I would say at least for most people, egg yolks are okay. Jury's still out on full fat dairy. Uh, saturated fat still implicated in heart disease. No matter what these keto gurus or anybody says, saturated fat is still very much implicated in heart disease. Uh, effects on heart health are well-researched and established. Olive oil, salmon, and avocados are still the champs. Salmon has omega-3 fats. Olive oil is a monounsaturated fat avocados, avocado oils are good. Walnut oils are good. So red and processed meats still frowned upon in almost all medical circles. And the double whammy here is that studies suggest that individuals who eat the most saturated fat probably aren't eating near enough fruits and vegetables either. So when they just anecdotally ask people in questionnaires, how much saturated fat do you eat or what are you eating? When they tallied up, the more saturated fat people are eating, 
the less overall fruits and vegetation they were eating. And that's, that's a terrible scenario because we know that these fruits and vegetables are like, they turn cancer off. These are the best, the best foods for us. And so there's that double whammy there. So the award goes to what is my favorite diet? What's the middle of the spectrum? What do I think we should all really focus on is the Mediterranean diet or the Mediterranean lifestyle. So this is inspired by the eating habits of Greece, Italy, and Spain in the 1960s. It includes high amounts of olive oil, legumes, unrefined grains, fruits, and vegetables, moderate to high amount of fish, moderate dairy products like cheese and yogurt, and moderate wine consumption, very low, very low consumption of non-fish meat, right? So uh, I'm going to talk more about why I like this, but this was a big game changer for me, especially the olive oil. Uh, people ask me all the time, Adam, how did you lose 125 pounds? And the first thing I say is I eat plenty of vegetables. And the second thing I say is I eat plenty of fat. Olive oil in itself, the reason people, they go on the kind of fad diet, right? Like they know they need to lose weight. Maybe you've done this. I've done this. You go get chicken breast, you get steamed broccoli and you eat steamed broccoli and chicken breast and carrot sticks. And maybe you eat yourself a little non-fat, sugar-free vanilla bean Greek yogurt or something and you're starving, right? I'm going to tell you something. You should put some olive oil on the broccoli. Eat, eat a copious amount of vegetables. Use olive oil. Try and find good quality fat-based salad dressing, Caesars, ranches, goddess, whatever you want, olive oil and vinegar. Use those good quality monounsaturated fats as salad dressing and ways to saute your vegetables because they will be delicious. It will be more satisfying. And when you pair that with good quality proteins, fish, tilapia, salmon, shrimp, uh, chicken breast, you'll be a lot better off. So I love the Mediterranean diet. And the cool thing is, if you start there, if we just go a little bit towards the hippie camp, we can go into that vegan realm. If you have spiritual beliefs or you have some sort of beliefs about um, meat, that's fine. You can go a little bit more towards that vegan camp. And if you are a person that doesn't do great on grains or anything, you can go just a little bit more towards that paleo camp and do a little bit heavier meat. This isn't, it's not a rule. It's just a general way of dieting. I kind of hit, I would say I'm pretty close to the standard maybe just a little bit more chicken, some ground turkey too, some of that poultry, probably more than like, you know, your Orthodox Mediterranean diet. But what, but I would say these are, this is sort of the bulletproof, uh, the bullet points that I use in my uh, philosophy and my protocols on, on how I nourish myself and try and maintain a massive weight loss. So doctors like it. Olive oil has uh, been shown to reduce all cause, all cause mortality in chronic diseases um, uh, number one diet recommended by the American Heart Association, number one on health grades every year, I think for the last five years, Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet has been the best. Ketogenic diet has been the worst. Easy adherence includes all your food groups, allows for alcohol, and doesn't disrupt your social patterns. Any, any restaurant you go to, you can get a salad, you can get some fish, you can get um, some shrimp, you can get a vegetarian dish, you can get some whole grains whatever it is, and you can get a glass of red wine, whatever. It's easy to adhere. It doesn't disrupt any of your patterns, right? So it's a great, it's a great lifestyle to adopt. So next slide. Here's just some recipes. I, uh, I put some, some images in here. This is shrimp, plantains, quinoa, potato cakes, and corn and black beans. The potato cakes are actually Marsala patties. They have them at Trader Joe's. They've got potatoes and carrots and peas and corn, and they're really good. They've got Indian spices in them. I eat, I eat them all the time. You can also get potato cakes or latka. Sometimes you can get black bean burgers, so like spicy black bean burgers. Don't get the ones with soy isolate. Isolate. Get the ones with black beans. Um, they might have some tapioca starch or some potato starch or something, but try and find those complex starches. Potatoes, beans, they're great. Um, Here's another one. I always say same salad every day. So that's my salad, Caesar salad, uh, some almonds and apple, those uh, bubbly water, seltzers, um, bubbly, Polar, LaCroix, they're all pretty good. Polar's a cheaper brand. Walmart has a very cheap brand, although I don't think it's as good. But, you know, I eat the same salad every day. I think this is a great habit for your workday lunch. You can prepare several days in advance, rotate when you get bored of the distant dressings, and opt for fat-based dressings over sweet dressings or with sugar and sweet artificial sweeteners. Salad swaps while you're eating out. So like I usually ask for more chicken or add another protein like shrimp, although shrimp are really expensive at restaurants, but I don't mind paying the upcharge. This is at California Pizza Kitchen and their shrimp is really good. 
Uh, ask for a fruit cup. They usually have one on a kid's menu. Also, bring your own nuts or your own fruit. I have no problem sneaking an apple into a restaurant in my pocket and bring in almonds. There's almonds in this picture. Opt for zero-calorie beverages. So I always get an unsweetened iced tea. Groceries and meal prep. I, you know, couples that prep together stay together. So this is my wife and I's uh, refrigerator a couple months ago on a Sunday. Uh, make grocery shopping non-negotiable. My mantra, same salad every day. Always have water with you. Incorporate leftovers. Carve out time on weekends. I literally, when I go to work or really leave the house for any extended period of time, take um, an ice chest with me. You could fit uh, a 12-pack of beer in my lunch cooler, right? Or maybe even an 18-pack of beer. It's a big cooler. It's rated for like eight hours. I bring ice packs. And I bring a lot of food with me. And I eat high volume, volume density. Or sometimes it's called volumetrics. Like, you know, if you think about it, fat is twice as calorie dense as carbohydrates and protein. That's why fat and oils and cheeses and some of these things are really dense. Olive oil is great. Salmon is great. Avocados are great. But when we start to run overall to where we're at a caloric surplus, that's when we're going to gain weight or have trouble losing weight. So always meal prep, always grocery shop. We uh, actually get our groceries. We order them in advance and then go pick them up. Now they'll deliver your groceries if you're willing to pay more for them. So no excuses. You got to get it done. And also make it easy, right? So this top slide, that's some uh, just pre-cooked chicken, right? Dude, just cook it throw it in the refrigerator the night before. I actually will prep my salads frozen. So I put the frozen chicken in the bottom. I put the Caesar dressing on top of it. And then I take bag lettuce and throw bag lettuce on top of it, put cracked pepper, and then I'll have three or four of them in my fridge. And then when I get to work, I just take it, shake it up. There, boom, I got a salad, right? And usually if you prep them frozen, they stay fresh longer. And then the next day when I get to lunch, it's usually thawed out. It's no big deal. Buy back your time by making things convenient. Don't expect your future self to have time or energy to follow through. Don't, ex don't make it harder on your future self. Lay the groundwork now. Have food available so your future self can make the better decisions because you can't expect yourself to make amazing decisions all the time, right? You can't expect yourself to do that. You are going to struggle at some times to make the decisions, and you need to kind of make room for that and just know, make it easier for yourself by being prepared. This is a slide vegetarian chili. I use this a lot. I'll make this in a slow cooker or I just make it uh, in a pot. Batch cook it on weekends. Always have canned essentials on hand. So beans, corn, kidney beans, all of it. You should always have that stuff on hand. Uh, chili powders, you can get low sodium. You can get mild, whatever you need. Taco powders, whatever. Find different things that you like to spice up chilies or Tex-Mex dish dishes, whatever. Uh, these are really great uses of legumes, proteins, good quality starches, good stuff right here. Uh, another recipe is salmon, like a Caesar salad, more of these more solid potato cakes, fruit. There's some grapes. I can't tell you how many times I eat protein in a Caesar salad. I, I, I bet you I've eaten that, that combo a thousand times in the last five years. Uh, here's some kebabs that I made, lots of vegetables, got some pineapple, uh, shrimp, chicken, peppers, onions. So uh, marinate it with healthy fats, incorporate lots of veggies, pair with a salad and a healthy starch. So these are great. Make a whole bunch of these and have a big old plate of that. And then maybe a sweet potato, a yam or something. Maybe some brown rice, some wild rice or something. Just pair it with a good starch. And uh, all of that's pretty low calorie. I mean, the heavier calories are going to be from the marinades and the olive oil. But remember, olive oil is that good quality fat. It's going to leave you satiated and it's good for your heart. Here's another recipe, ground turkey burgers. Um, just with some salad, olive oil, and broccoli. Uh, that's kind of a, a real lean lean dish that I eat a lot. Um, it's really good. I enjoy it. Uh, counting calories and macros. This is something that's become really like a big deal in our, in, in fitness, really. It's this idea of if, if it fits your macros, get enough protein and just kind of balance things out. Otherwise eat whatever you want. Um, may be beneficial, but I don't think calorie counting and macro counting and hyper -focus, being hyper-focused on proteins and different stuff is really that essential. Uh, I like the Weight Watchers point system better. I lost the first 90 pounds I lost on Weight Watchers. Um, it's easy to adhere to. It's a lot easier to understand that that's five points rather than having to think that's 280 calories and plus this oil and it makes it this and all that. A lot easier just to chunk things down and make things a little bit. Weight Watchers is a bit big picture and macro. It's going to help you with portion control. And you're going to have to make more, deci more decisions and kind of learn a little bit about what is satiating rather than just going with calories, right? 
because Weight Watchers will give you a list of free foods and you'll be able to pair your free foods and then you're going to be budgeting more of your fats. So Weight Watchers still does kind of demonize fat, but um, you're going to get some mileage out of that olive oil. Remember, I'm going to come back to it. It's heart healthy and it's satiating. So, but Weight Watchers now, I mean, vegetables, chicken breasts, diced tomatoes, fruit, a lot of this stuff is zero points. So they give you a smaller point budget but you're going to be able to top things off and really boister up your meals and make them a lot fuller and add volume with these free foods, quote unquote, free foods that still have calories, but they're good choices. So the algorithm is going to promote those and demonize those higher, uh, those, those higher, um, more calorie dense foods. Um, counting calories and measuring food can be unsustainable in long term. It could cause obsessions and preoccupations with food increases anxiety with individuals with ED, which is eating disorders, right? So if you have a history of disordered eating, be careful with all of this stuff. I'll give you a big disclaimer now. It's, it's a really challenging thing. It can have different trigger points and it can really screw up people's psychology. So odds are if you're a compulsive dieter or if you're morbidly obese, you've already got some of that going on, but tread lightly. And just remember you're working on an overall trend in process of moving forward. You don't necessarily have to get it all right immediately, Go easy on yourself, build good foundational essential habits and just a base layer of knowledge and what works for you and move forward gently, always with self-love. Calorie restriction. So when you're going to lose weight, if, when I was 304 pounds, I had to restrict calories. I had to reduce portions. I had to eat more, eat less fuel than I was putting out and burning to get started, right? So I saw a registered dietitian. I got diagnosed with prediabetes by a medical doctor and given a, a multiple warnings. So Start with medical professionals. This is necessary to treat obesity. The thing within the fad diet community is this idea that you're going to eat whatever you want, you're going to eat as much as you want, and you're still going to lose the weight. And that's just not true. You could eat a perfect plant-based diet or whatever you want. If you're eating more caloric energy than you consume, you're going to you're going to either you're going to gain weight. You're not going to lose weight, right? I don't care if you're in keto ketogenic diet. I don't care if you're eating no carbs, if you eat an excessive ma amount of caloric energy, you're going to, you're going to uh, gain weight or, or be unable to lose weight. Right. But calorie restriction is important. It's essential for weight loss. It gets complicated with hormones and metabolic syndrome, right? So the more overweight you are, the more complicated things get, right? Uh, so you really shouldn't exceed two pounds per week or a 20% reduction in your total caloric intake. If you do that, you're going to be a sitting duck for yo-yo diet and you're going to lose lean muscle mass. And when they, when they've studied people who yo-yo, the people who lost the most lean mass during a calorie restriction were the, the most likely to yo-yo diet and not only gain the way back, but gain more than they were in the beginning. So remember slow and steady wins the race. This could get more difficult as time progresses. Fiber and protein can help and hydration trying to stay fuller as you're reducing your caloric intake to lose weight. And morbidly obese individuals may have complex issues, issues with um, skin, issues uh, with all sorts of stuff. They may even initially, even with really good habits, I still had high blood sugars, not terribly high, but they were still in that worrisome range. And even today, eating a great diet, my, my fasting glucose, it's not, it's not near in the pre-diabetic pre range anymore. But I still run higher. I still run on the upper end of normal and healthy, just part probably genetics and perhaps part of um, what uh, over the years of just eating a ton of carbs and treating my body poorly for several years. Beware of the binge. You know, if you if you diet long enough, you're going to you're going to struggle. So you have to have meals and snacks readily available. Don't keep junk food in the house. If there's ice cream in my house, I'm eating ice cream. So it's got I, I got to keep it out of the house. Stay hydrated. Avoid hyperpalatable foods. So chips, Cheetos, pizza, uh, ice cream. I'm not saying we can never have these things, but if they're in the house and they're regular occurrences in your life, you're going to struggle. So these hyperpalatable foods, these are foods that are designed to be really good, uh, really pleasurable, and they're dangerous. And I personally think we should be uh, having the same level of vigilance we have with sugars, refined carbohydrates. I think we should practice the same level of vigilance with refined carbs as we do with alcohol. For instance, everybody knows you probably shouldn't wake up and start drinking alcohol at eight or nine in the morning. Most of us have a, a certain amount of respect and caution around alcohol. I think we should have the same amount of caution with refined carbohydrate. I'm not saying you're a junkie if you eat a donut. I'm just saying these these foods have proven and there's 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 research to suggest that they are highly addictive um 
don't overexercise or punish yourself through activity. I have a rule if I um if if I eat a bit much or if I find myself struggling with overeating a bit, I won't work out that day. So I don't ever work out on a day that I had kind of a tough food day. I no longer call them bad food days, just some days for any number of reasons. Maybe I have a meal that I don't enjoy and then I and I eat something else later, whatever it is. Any number of reasons. If I have a day where I kind of have a little bit of guilt around food or I overeat a little bit, I, I don't exercise that day. So I don't ever try and compensate or punish. Uh, journal about your emotional triggers and consider support. You know, OA is Overeaters Anonymous, EDA is Eating Disorders Anonymous, any other 12 step groups or Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, whatever, um, you know, a bariatric support group, whatever. Like, try and find other people who are also struggling because you'll be able to understand either from the people that are struggling and the people who have gotten better and some of the professionals that kind of hang out around some of these programs, you'll be able to find some, um, some common ground with other people. Practice mindful or intuitive eating. So remember, intuitive eating is a really different goal than, say, weight loss. But intuitive eating would be really good for that person who is at a normal weight and is learning to eat with self-love, enjoy foods uh, in moderation, stuff like that. That's going to be a different goal than, say, losing 120 pounds. But Oh, it's a good goal to head towards and maybe a strategy that you can learn later on down the road. I've done my best to learn some of that and it's, it's pretty hard, but you know, um, I hang in there and, and I feel like, I, I feel like I've managed to be pretty mindful about what I'm eating and um, I'm pretty careful not to be too restrictive, but also I exercise a good amount of caution and I, um, I use a pretty strict protocol with how I eat to make sure I'm not, you know, constantly uh causing myself a lot a lot of misery and cravings because i'm eating uh eating too much uh, junk um apps and monitors can be helpful initially but aren't very accurate i don't think that that's very accurate um same issues as tracking and countering can trigger anxiety and obsession not great for people with eating disorders um i've tried several i no longer use apps or monitors i do follow the step count on my phone although you know um, the phone and most of the time it's on my desk, but if it's in my, if it's in my pant pocket, you know, I'll count my steps and I, um, but that's really about as far as I go. I don't use a, a Fitbit anymore. Fasting. This is a really big buzz concept right now. ADF or alternate day fasting five, two, which is five days of normal eating and two low calorie days or IF intermittent fasting. Uh, the research really, it shows no benefit over traditional dieting weight loss, but the time restricted eating patterns. So I'm not talking about these don't eat for two days or anything or um, uh, alternate day or anything, just time restricted feeding where like, you know, you have 10, 12, 14 hours where you're fasting, which is totally doable if you don't eat in the evenings and, uh, and you don't eat again until you wake up. There may be some metabolic uh, benefits such as improved uh, blood sugar control and insulin sensitivity uh, could be helpful in adherence to the glucose control and the hunger hormones. Uh, the easiest strategy for me, I do practice it most of the time and uh, I don't eat after dinner. And I've tried to kind of consistently shift my dinner forward to where, you know, I'm going to bed empty four or five hours and then I sleep for eight hours. And then maybe I just have some coffee and water in the morning and don't rush into breakfast. So it's really pretty common for me to get a 14 hour fast in just because I eat early and I don't eat breakfast right out of the, out the gate. Although it's not too extreme and I try not to obsess over it too much. Although I think it's a good strategy for me because it allows me, I really like to feel full. And so it allows me to sort of compact most of my meals into more of like an eight or 10 hour periods of the day. And then when I'm fasting, I just stay really hydrated. It helps me sleep really well. I kind of dig it. So I do uh, in, in, enjoy the IF, the intermittent fasting or the time restricted feeding, although I don't obsess over it. And I don't think you need to be going farther than 14 or 16 hours. Um, unless you want to, if you like it, you like it, but you're, you're going to be playing with that, that, that line of uh, some disordered stuff, I think. And it has the same issues, you know, it could be a trigger if you have a history and, and, and you're a compulsive dieter. So fitness, here's some quotes here. No one ever regretted a finished workout. And, uh, uh, this is one of mine. I've never once been mad after a run. And then here's a Lane Norton quote, exercise to stimulate, not to annihilate. The world wasn't formed in a day and neither were you. Uh, set small goals and build upon them. So uh, major mental health benefits to exercise. So Walden University study, it reduces anxiety and depression, reduces perceived levels of stress, helps us become more resilient, boosts self-esteem and confidence. I know that to be true in my case. Better quality sleep, brain booster, neurogenesis. Neurogenesis is when your brain um, creates more uh, brain cells. So variety is huge. Cardio, so running, biking, hiking, conditioning, hit strength training, weights, exercise, 
body weights, mobility, Pilates, stretching, yoga, stress relief, relaxation, Tai Chi, all of it. Variety is huge. Do a little something every day and have stuff that you can do at home, have stuff you can do at a gym, have stuff you can do with friends at class, do stuff you can do at work. Um, mitochondria and conditioning. I'm just going to zip through this pretty quick, but we want to get to a point where we can put out 60%, 60 to 70% of our max heart rate, which you can find by taking 220 and subtracting your age, because the more we can train at that zone two, at that fat burning stage, the more efficiency we are going to get um, in metabolizing glucose and fatty acids. So elite athletes can accomplish four or five, six times more work while remaining in that anaerobic state. Usually in that zone two, you're still, you're still, you're not, you're not so hardcore that you're, that you're going past oxygen, right? So in that zone two, you should be able to stay aerobic, meaning you're, um, you're working out hard enough, but not so hard that you have to go, you have to move. So once the body can't get enough oxygen to put out, to put out the work, if you continue to push your heart, your body has to start metabolizing other stuff other than glucose to, uh, to get the output. And so usually you want to condition really well at that 60 to 70% max range. That way you're continuing to get more efficient at metabolizing oxygen and glucose and sort of, this is why cyclists have huge legs. They have little upper body, but they have huge legs and they can eat whatever they want because they're out there riding 30, 40 miles. I have friends that ride over a hundred miles a week, Monday through Friday, they're riding 30, 40 miles after work and stuff. And they can eat anything they want and stay thin because they're burning so many calories. Uh, because the leg muscles are an enormous muscles. Your quads, your glutes, and your hamstrings are the biggest muscles on your body. And when you cycle, you work all of them. So much higher tolerance of carbohydrates after these adapt adaptations set in. So we should all be working towards that. I'm not saying we should all do that, but we should be trying our best. Mobility. These guys here on the right, these are Aboriginal guys. These uh, guys are squatting. So if you go out in the jungle and stuff, people don't uh, on the Australian outback or whatever, people don't have chairs. So they, they squat. You know, my chiropractor taught me this. This is another guy who's using a pose to do an Aboriginal squat or what's called an assisted squat. This is the number one thing I tell people if they have back problems. This helps my back so much. I do Aboriginal squats every single day. I do them at work. I do them at home. They're great. Uh, this is called a pretzel stretch. The one on the left is a pretzel stretch. Helps with those uh, hip flexors and the hamstrings and all and your, uh, your hips. Uh, the, the guy on the right is doing a quad stretch. Uh, cardiovascular exercise. So we talked about that a few minutes ago, but it's great for conditioning. Cheap and easy. You can do it at home or in your neighborhood. Good for busy people and a little goes a long way. Very good mental health benefits. And self-love, right? So don't use exercise to earn food. Don't punish yourself. And fuel your workouts and recovery properly. And be cautious of industry uh, injuries. So um, anyway, that's it. That's all my slides. That's the entire slide deck. So anyway, I hope you got something out of that. Um, love to talk to you one-on-one -on -one more about what I do as a coach and how I help people facilitate the same changes and transformations that I have, right? I've lost 120 pounds, was a daily drinker. I don't drink alcohol. I quit smoking. I've really found um, financial health, career health, right? Wellness is this whole thing about our whole, our whole body, uh, body, mind, and spirit. So I really am passionate about wellness. I'd love to tell you more of my story and help you, help you build your own amazing transformation. So you, I'm sure you have a powerful story, uh, but working with a coach one-on-one -on -one can be really helpful. So anyway, Go to adamstevenscoaching.com. You can join my mailing list. Uh, I do a one, a free one hour consult with anybody. Just jump on my calendar. There's a link in the chat. And uh, I teach live here in St. Louis. My next one is going to be on uh, August the 21st in Chesterfield, Missouri. And share this info with your friends and loved ones. So thanks for coming on for everybody who's on Zoom or on the phone. And I'm going to, uh, I'll stop the lecture and then maybe we could do some Q&A. So anyway, thanks a lot and uh, take it easy.